talk is going to be about um, our research on single photon sources, um, which are realized with quantum dots, self-assembled quantum dots. And in particular, I'm going to show um, what actually limits the single photon purity um, when we um, excited resonantly. And um, after that, in the second part, um, I'm going to show how we can even get some very counterintuitive behavior from a quantum dot, where in a particular regime, the quantum dot is actually more likely to emit two photons rather than just one. And in the final um, part, I'm going to explain how we can maybe make use of that knowledge to um, suppress re-excitation processes and, and really get very good um, sources of single photons with these quantum dots. So with that, I, I'm just going to quickly introduce the sample structures that we use. So um, we have, let me just, I forgot to turn on the laser pointer. Um, so we, we below our quantum dots in order to improve the light extraction efficiency, we have a distributed Bragg reflector consisting of several layers of aluminum arsenide and gallium arsenide. And the critical thing here is that similar to uh, what Matthias has ju just shown, we embed our quantum dot into the intrinsic region of our diet. However, in our case, that's um, an NI Schottky diet. And what this does is it al allows us to stabilize the electrical environment of our quantum dots and also um, similar to what Mashia showed, that's why I'm um, skipping it more or less, we can control the electric environment such that we get these, in, in this PLV measurements, we get these um, nice charge stable plateaus with a sharp transition in between, for, for instance, the neutral exciton and the negatively charged trion. What you can also see here is that there's a small tilt to these lines which is due to the quantum confined start, stock effect, which allows us, that's actually a very helpful feature because in, in the experiment, in resonance fluorescence experiments, it allows us to sort of fine tune the emission energy such that it exactly matches um, our laser energy. Now, let's take a look at the temporal evolution of such a two-level system and the pulsed excitation. So let's consider this two-level system here. And when we drive that with, with a short laser pulse, um, we can, um, prepare it in a superposition of its ground and excited state. And when we do that, after the, the pulse has been absorbed, the remaining system dynamics are essentially um, just governed by the spontaneous emission, which means that we get this emission probability um, that decays exponentially with time, as, as can be seen here. So the laser pulse is this gray dotted line here. And one popular mecha mechanism to prepare a system in, in, a, in the desired state is the, the optically driven Rabi oscillation. And as you can see here in the experiment, we don't really observe perfectly sinusoidal oscillations, but rather damping. This can be, for, for instance, due to phonon coupling, which I won't discuss in detail here. But um, one other thing one needs to take into account when looking at uh, something like this is that in the real world, our laser pulses are not um, infinitely short. So with short, we mean short relative to the radiative lifetime of the excited state. So um, we took a quantum trajectory approach where we um, simulated for different trajectories the system can take um, in order to get out this, emission, um, this excited state probability as a function of time. So as you can see here, now we have a real, realistic laser pulse with a finite um, duration and um, the green line depicts uh, like a, a typical um, trajectory the system can take. And, and in this case, it's one that's very likely to, to be taken, namely that the pulse is first fully absorbed by the system before at some later point in time, the system decays and um, emits a photon in the process. Now, if we do this um, calculation for um, thousands of these trajectories, we can come up with a time dependent um, excited state probability that already shows a qualitative difference with respect to the ideal case. And uh, in the inset here, you, you can see what we can also extract from the simulation, and that, and that is the um, n photon probability. So uh, as you can see, indeed, even uh, like for cases where the pulse is short, 
relative to, to the radiative lifetime, we indeed have um, for a pi pulse, should I say, so the simulation here is for a pulse area of one pi, so we are around here. We have um, mainly a single photon emission, but there's a small two photon emission. Um, now, in the experiment, we can I, I get to, at least to some degree get access to this photo count distribution by doing a hand barrier brown and twist experiment where we um, essentially measure this G2 of at tau time delay, which gives sort of the, or is proportional to the conditional probability of detecting a photon at detector two at time tau, given that we've already detected a photon at detector one at time zero. And if we do that for different time, um, yeah, if we do that, we can get this histogram shown here. And as you can see, there is um, a separation between this column, these columns of 30 nanoseconds, which corresponds to the laser repetition rate, but exactly at zero time delay, um, we have a huge drop in counts, and that's because there are essentially no coincidence counts or very few coincidence counts um, for this um, zero time delay. And um, our, our idea now is to look a little bit, bit more closely because, um, as I've said um, on the previous slide, we need to take into consideration that uh, the pulse is not um, just absorbed at one point in time. So if we take a look at our trajectory, trajectories again, we have a pulse area of one pi in between these two gray vertical lines. And uh, in the ideal case, what we would expect is that um, our excited state probability will just increase and um, approach the limit of one after the pulse has been fully absorbed. However, um, since our laser pulse duration is finite, the system can also take um, a tra trajectory like this one, where it already decays before the pulse has been fully absorbed, which means there is enough pulse area left to re-excite the system with a certain chance, which means that at the, at the end of this trajectory, we get two photons out. And this is what ultimately spoils our G2 at zero time delay, and hence also deteriorates the quality of our single photon source. Um, so here you can see a simulation of this G2 at zero time delay as we decrease the pulse duration. And as, you, as expected, if we approach more and more the ideal case of an instantaneous preparation, our G2 at zero gets better. And this is also supported by our, ex by our experiment. Now, from our simulations, we can also extract the single and two photon probabilities now as a function of the pulse width. And as you can see, there's actually a regime where the two phot photon emission probability peaks. Um, now, the ra typical Rabi oscillations, in the ideal case that you would expect, um, where the, your signal oscillates between one, between one and zero, this, given this, these re-excitation processes that can take place, um, we think that there's a, um, a better signature for these Rabi oscillations by going to what um, we call the expected number of emitted photons. And as you can see, at one pi pulse area, it's already slightly above one, because remember we have this small two photon contribution at this point. Now, as you can see, this gap widens in particular for these even pi pulses. So at two pi or four pi, uh, we have a pretty big gap between the number of expected photons um, and the ideal Rabi oscillation where we wouldn't, wouldn't have any photons emitted. So from now on, let's take a look at um, these pulse areas here. So if we now measure the expected number, or th that's at the end of the day, the, that what's directly accessible in the experiment, if we take these Rabi oscillations and um, um, fit our model to it, we, we can get a very nice agreement with the, with the data, as you can see here. And in particular, at two pi pulses, um, we have a substantial deviation from the ideal case value of zero here. Now, if we take the G2 measurement here, we, we can see that um, at zero time delay, we now observe a strong bunching. And this can only be explained in the following way. So if we go back to our quantum trajectory approach, we have now a two pi pulse, which is shown, shown in gray here. And even though the most likely case, of course, is still to not emit any photons at all, um, 
what, one other thing that can happen is that after one pi area of the pulse has been absorbed, the system has the highest probability density to decay back to the ground state, emitting a photon in the process, which means that at this point, we still have one pi pulse area left, which is perfectly capable and very likely to drive the system up to the excited state again, from where it will decay at some later point. Which means that in, in this instance, we get two photons out rather than none. And if we take a look at this photocon distribution, we see what I just said. Um, at c c um, our zero um, photon emission line is still the likeliest thing to happen, but our two photon emission is actually more likely to occur at a two pi pulse area than the single photon emission. And while it's visible, the three photon emission is still rather negligible. Um, now, here we are plotting the um, probability to emit n photons as a function of the pulse area with the um, green line indicating the single photon emission. And as you can see, it's pretty much in phase to the ideal Rabi oscillation with the two photon emission probability out of phase. And um, you can't prob probably just about make it out that, that there's, a, there's a purple line as well from the three photon emission, but as I said before, it's rather negligible. And in order to visualize this, crossover where actually the two photon emission gets more likely than the single photon emission, we can introduce um, a different quantity, the um, photon number purity, which essentially just renormalizes our um, n number, um, n photon emission probability by taking away the, also the vacuum component. And if we plot that, we can see that at around even pi pi pulses, there's a regime where the two photon emission is more likely than a single photon emission. And we Will, can also- William, yes? two minutes left. Okay, thank you, okay. thank you very much. I, I'm going to hurry a bit. Um, so this matches really nicely with our, the data that, that we took. And in particular, one thing I wanted to, want to stress here is that fitting parameters here are taken fixed as fixed parameters because we essentially use the same parameters that we got out when fitting this. And they were taken as fixed parameters when fitting this data and you can see it matches really well. Um, we can also decrease the pulse duration and we see this behavior. I can explain it maybe in the question round if someone is interested, I, I would like to skip this for now. So here we changed the pulse, pulse duration and, and take, took a look at the G2 values. But um, as I outlined in the beginning, I really want to introduce um, of a, a diff different excitation scheme, which allows us to improve our um, single photon purity, because as you meant, as you've seen, the, um, the these re-excitation processes are what, what's limiting us there. And in particular, one particular um, particularly helpful scheme is the bi-exciton exciton cascade, where we make use of the uh, bi-exciton, which is um, energetically shifted from twice the exciton energy by what's called the binding energy EB due to the additional charge carrier pair, you've got um, more shielding such that um, this energy drops. And if we now have a um, two photon absorption process, um, the subsequent emission will lead to, to um, the following spectrum where we have at long, longer wavelengths, the uh, by exciton to exciton transition with the exciton to ground state transition at a slightly higher energy. And the, the big advantage here is that our laser sits right here in the middle in between the two emission lines. And what that means is that if one of the two, two decays happens or when, when any decay happens, our laser is out of resonance and is simply incapable of driving the system again. So we expect a, an improvement in the G2 value. And also technically at this point, we, one wouldn't even have to um, make use of a cross polar polarized excitation and detection scheme as you, you do when you do resonance fluorescence. So you could even gain a, um, some, some um, value in the brightness department as well. So again, we can do nice Rabi oscillations, but the really interesting, uh, the, the real highlight, let's say, comes when we take a look at the G2 measurements. And as you can see, we again have this uh, separation of 30 nanoseconds, which um, corresponds to the um, emission rate of our laser, but at zero time delay, there's essentially no peak whatsoever. And we are actually at this point limited by the dark count rate of our spats. Um, um, yeah. If we, take a, if we take a look at the simulations, 
we have the two-level system here um, indicated by the blue line and also the simulations already predict for a four-level system like the bike system system um, that uh, at short pulse length we do indeed get an improvement in the G2 value and that's also supported by our experiment but as you can see due to our not really up to the task um, spats we have an error that's actually bigger than the value that we could extract here but um, the uh, but Lukas Schweikert from the Stockholm group, they managed in a similar experiment to um, derive an even better value at 7.5 times 10 to the minus, oops, 7.5 times 10 to the minus five with an error of around 1.4 times 10 to the minus five because they have um, superconducting single photon detectors which um, really have an- So William, sorry to interrupt, rate. but time is up. I'll just leave up the okay. summary slide then for you. Um, I think you all paid attention to, so you know what, what I just talked about and I'm happy to answer your questions and thank you for thank you all for your attention all right thank you very much for this nice talk all right we are ready for questions <laughs>